Well, hello and good afternoon. Welcome to the Cave 20 virtual community and our third webinar in our series of special speakers being made available to our Cave 2020 virtual community. I'm Jan Gustafson Correa, CEO for Cave. And while I wish we could have been together in San Francisco last week for the Cave 2020 conference, I hope that today you are in a safe space managing the circumstances due to COVID-19 and that you feel ready to join together with your Cave Familia today and over the next several weeks via the Cave 2020 virtual community websites and webinars. I'm so pleased now to get us started to introduce you to Olivia Yaya, our Cave board president. Olivia? Hello everyone and good afternoon. Today's webinar is being presented by our longtime friend, researcher, coach, and guide, Dr. Kathy Escamilla, and sponsored by the generous support of Caslon Publishing and Consulting, a platinum level sponsor of CAVE 2020. As we get ready for today's exciting session, I have a few housekeeping matters to share. As this is a webinar, the speakers' microphones will be active and the participants will all be on mute. If you would like to pose a question during the presentation, please use the chat icon on the Zoom control menu at the bottom of your screen. And the chat window will pop up where you will be able to type in your questions or comments. For better focus, we will not be using the Q&A icon or window for today. After the webinar, we will be posting the recorded version on the CAVE 2020 virtual community website so you can re-listen and share it with others. Sit back, relax, and get ready for 45 minutes of powerful engagement and learning. To get us started, join me in welcoming Rebecca Field of Caslon Publishing and Consulting who will be introducing to all of us, Dr. Kathy Escamilla, who will be presenting today on equity, evidence and advocacy in the development of bilingualism, biliteracy and cross-culture competence. Welcome Rebecca and Caslon. Thank you very much. Hello from Philadelphia. Um, first, I want to thank Kabe for putting together this virtual Kabe 2020 community in such a short period of time. It's incredible to work with them. They're an amazing team and thank you all of Kabe. I also want to say that it's great to be with all of you here virtually and I'm sorry I couldn't see you in California in San Francisco. But we look forward to seeing you next year in Long Beach and you can continue the conversation with Kathy Escamilla and others about biliteracy. Many of you may know Kathy Escamilla and her colleagues with Literacy Squared. They're, they have contributed more than 15 years of research, theory, policy, and practice on biliteracy that strongly influences the dual language bilingual education field today. Their book with Caslon is called Biliteracy from the Start, Literacy Squared in Action, co-authored by, okay, get a load of this, Kathy Escamilla, Susan Hopewell, Sandra Butvolovsky, Wendy Sparrow, Lucinda Soltero Gonzalez, Olivia Ruiz Figueroa, and Manuel Escamilla. Quite a collaborative team. And this book's been embraced um, by biliteracy teachers and administrators nationally and internationally. When I work with schools and with districts across the country, I use their holistic biliteracy framework to emphasize the need to teach and assess for, bi for biliteracy for Spanish and English side by side and to never look at English in isolation. I also am really emphasize the importance of empirical evidence of students' trajectories towards biliteracy to drive instruction, program development, and professional learning. And I'm really excited to announce that Kathy Escamilla with her colleague Sandra Butvolovsky and Susan Hopewell will also be authoring a book on biliterate writing that hopefully will be ready for you next year by Cabe 2021. And now let's hear it from Kathy Escamilla from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Hey. Hello everyone and good afternoon. I can't tell you how honored I am um, and also very nervous 
uh, to be uh, with you this afternoon. I want you to know that I miss Kaveh. It's one of my favorite conferences all year. And I mostly miss the people. I, I learn a lot, uh, but it's, it's one of my favorite gathering places to see new, young, passionate teachers, uh, people I've known for the last 40 years, um, to hear bilingual jokes, and just the overall opportunity to convive with uh, like-minded people. So I miss you all, but I do pledge that if I'm able, I will be in Long Beach in 2021 and hope that we're all there in person. So um, the title of my talk today is Equity, Evidence, and Advocacy in the Development of Bilingualism, Biliteracy, and Cross-Cultural Competence. That's quite a long title, and there, that's my 30 minutes, so hope you liked it. Um, just, get, just kidding, just kidding. It's a long title. I also want to give a shout out. I understand we have some people um, uh, and the webinar from Brazil. So I would like to give a shout out to our international colleagues who are joining. Um, my, the purpose of what I'm going to talk about today has everything to do with the fact that California had a major victory four years ago in the passage of Proposition 58. That's really good news. The really bad news is that Proposition 227 preceded it, and we lost a generation of potential bilingual, bicultural, biliterate people. And so now's an opportunity to regain what we've lost. But I think we have to learn some lessons from the past, and we have to proceed with caution and make sure that our programs are everything that they might be for all of the kids that we want to, um, that we're hoping to reach. So this afternoon, I actually only have three major points I would like to make, and I, I really look forward to the question and answer. So what for the first thing is, since my career started uh, in 1971, and you can figure out how old I am, but since my career started way back then, our bilingual programs have always been faced with monolingual English pedagogies and monolingual English um, policies. And so we've been given programs that were created for monolingual English speaking kids, and we have been asked to tweak them and sometimes most unfortunately just to translate them into Spanish or other languages. So in recreating and looking forward to the 21st century programs, we need to put language and cultures at the center of what we're doing, not on the periphery, not as an afterthought, not to be tweaked. So I have three things I want to say in regard to that. One, um, since 1998, which is when I believe Proposition 227 was passed, the children are different. Um, they're what we call the new normal. Um, the second point I want to make is that I think I really want to emphasize that we need to develop language writ large, that we think sometimes of teaching language in very narrow ways, and I would like to, for us to broaden that perspective, and the same with biliteracy. So those are the three main things. Each one of them could be a day-long seminar. I only have 30 minutes, so I'm going to move right along. So what are the new normal? What's different? In 1997, the majority of kids in California schools who carried the label English learner, who we call emerging bilingual kids now, uh, were sequential bilinguals. Now the majority of kids are simultaneous bilinguals. Why does that make a difference and why do we need to care? Um, so 85% of the kids who enter US schools now as emerging bilinguals were born in the US. I need to make, without making a political statement, to make one. That means these children enjoy all the rights and privileges of being US citizens. And we can't forget that. So simultaneous bilinguals are kids who, um, although there's no one definition, um, they are kids who were exposed to or began learning two languages before the age of five. So born in the US, maybe went to a preschool where English was the medium of instruction, come into kindergarten where there's a bilingual program. Quite different from the way I became a bilingual, was, which was in a sequential way. Sequential bilinguals are kids who learn two languages after the age of six and after acquiring a first one. Now, why is this important, if at all? It's important because most of us who are creating programs and policies for emerging bilingual kids are sequential bilinguals. And we're creating programs for simultaneous bilinguals, sometimes misunderstanding normal language behaviors of simultaneous bilingual kids. So this is a graph, if you didn't believe me, from the US Department of Education that just shows um, that most of our kids who carry the, la the label English learner were born in the United States as about 85% in grades K to five. 
Now, I, I want to spend just one minute talking about the way we misunderstand simultaneous bilinguals. So you can, uh, I don't have any way of judging your body language. I usually have people raise their hands or stand up or do something, but since I can only see me, um, I'm guessing that you have kids, if, you're a young if you are an elementary school teacher, who come into your classroom and say things like, es this red, verdad, teacher? Or Kimberly está esquipiando? Or are they me Game Boy, me MP3 and me Cubby? Or let's go, vámonos. Now, this, these are things that simultaneous bilingual kids do that cause people to say, pues este niño ni inglés ni español. They are kids that, that have been perceived to be kids with low language development in two languages. And then the question is, well, if this child doesn't know either language very well, maybe we should just be, we just should teach in English. And I'm gonna argue that that's not the viewpoint that we should have, nor should we have a deficit viewpoint of these kind of linguistic behaviors. So we could pick up a textbook, including ones that we use in teacher education, and we could see that um, somebody might say, well, this is a child, if he says, that's yes, read for that teacher, where two languages are interfering with each other. This is a child who's low language in both languages. This is a child who's semi-lingual. This was a made up word by some professor who wanted to make money off of a book, not me. Um, this is Spanglish. This is Tex-Mex. Okay, now what I'm gonna invite you to do is to, analyze this, these children's normal bilingual behaviors simultaneously from a different lens. And, and that lens could be one that more recently might be called translanguaging, or one that in my day we called interlanguage. So all language is learned in context. When a child goes to preschool, and uh, the preschool is English medium, the child learns the big person in the front of the room is a teacher, and the colors are red and blue and green. Child goes to kindergarten and says, este es red, verdad, teacher. Why? Because the context of the preschool was English. The context of the child's neighborhood and home may be Spanish. All languages learned in context, and this child is growing up in a bilingual context. Kimberly está esquipiando. We all borrow words. We borrow words in English freely from other languages that we like. The, the word macho has taken on a whole different meaning since it was adopted into English. We have a charge de affairs. Who knows why? Our government's all in English, but we have words like this that we've borrowed. In this case, this child borrowed the word skip, and Kimberly está esquipiando, and has conjugated it in a way that is absolutely grammatically correct. So, um, grammar rules get overgeneralized in English when four year old kids come and say, I go to the store and I buy clothes. Um, we don't worry about it because we know that's what four and five year olds do. That's what four and five year old simultaneous bilingual kids do, but we haven't had a good theory for that. Pri pri prior to the last uh, 15, 20 years in this country. Were they me Game Boy and me Cubby? Kids know that some words can't be translated like a Cubby. Well, how do you say that in Spanish? You don't. And an MB3 player is an MP3 player, although I get to really know what one is. Um, let's go, vamos. Let's go, children, hurry up. So when we want to give added emphasis, we do that. We can do that in one language, and simultaneous bilingual kids can do it in two. Now, the problem isn't that kids do it. The problem is that we see it as a problem. So Bill and, and Jose come to, to kindergarten, and Jose knows three colors, red, green, and yellow. And he, and he knows both of them in Spanish and English, and he gets labeled as low in both languages. Bill comes to school and he knows five colors, all in English, but he gets labeled as average. So who knows more? The theory of bilingual, uh, of holistic bilingualism as underscored by simultaneous bilinguals say, uh, Bill knows five, five plus zero equals five, but Jose knows three in Spanish and three in English and three plus three is six. So we need to begin to see the normal behaviors of the majority of the kids who are coming into our schools as assets to be developed and not problems to be solved. That's number one. The second point I wanna make is to begin to create a conversation about developing languages writ large. And by writ large, I mean, I've taught in schools um, and I've worked in places where we tend to view language development as a linguistic exercise. Worse than that 
in many places for the last few years, we have um, dropped the English language development classes in favor of very narrow scripted reading programs for English speaking kids that don't allow kids the opportunity to develop oral language or to, to engage in um, other kinds of language learning. So there are four ways of developing language. And I would argue that in the new post Proposition 58 world of California, yay, that we need to consider all four of them. Uh, because most of the kids who are gonna be coming into bilingual and dual language schools will be kids who were born in California or born in the United States. So the, I put the linguistic one big and bold uh, because that's the one we pay the most attention to. Uh, we don't pay much attention to the cognitive uh, advantages of being bilingual, bi bilingual. We pay little attention to the emotional baggage that comes along with learning two languages, not if you are a native English speaking kid, but if you are a child who's coming from uh, a home where the language isn't the societal language, Language learning is emotional and it's also psychological. And I think we need to pay attention to all four of those. So I use this, I know that the, the image here is um, fuzzy, but I think that's the state of the field. So I left it as fuzzy, I didn't uh, fix it up. The very bottom of the, the little circles, you see something there called phon uh, phonemes and phonology. Um, I'm gonna argue that we need to de-emphasize the very narrow focus we have right now on the teaching of phonemes and phonology, especially for kids in the early grades and especially for kids who are coming into a second language. Um, because even from a linguistic viewpoint, language learning is also about morphology and syntax and semantics and pragmatics and text. I'm gonna to say to you, we need to teach a rich repertoire of language registers, skills, and pragmatics for everyone. And if that isn't in our language programs, then we're kind of doing 20th century language teaching to 21st century kids. <clears throat> and we need to emphasize the importance of context in language teaching. And I think we need to replace the words academic language, and this is no, no uh, knock on Jim, Jim Cummins. Langu academic language is a register of a full linguistic program, but we need to replace that because academic language has become one more way that we label emerging um, simultaneous bilingual kids as low level language learners uh, with something called a rich linguistic repertoire. Um, Jim Cummins calls a narrow focus on um, the linguistic aspects of, uh, of language teaching as grammar and syntax, what does he call them? Grammar and syntax training centers, like you're going to the army or something. Um, so, uh, I'm going to show you this, and I know you can't respond right now, but what I'm going to do, I'm meaning to do here, is to illustrate all of the language skills you need to understand a meme in front of Starbucks. So this says, if you can't read it, I'm, I hope you can, booze and calculus don't mix, don't drink and derive. So what do we have to know? Um, you can't see. We have, to, we have to know that booze is a casual way of talking about alcohol, right? Is that academic language or something else? That calculus and derive might be the most academic of the terms, um, but don't drink and derive is something that is a play on words that actually comes from a television commercial. And we need to understand all of this in order to understand the meme. A narrow focus on any kind of a language skill will not do. And for our kids who are coming into bilingualism and biliteracy, they need to know this and they need the, the, the rich repertoire of language teaching in both languages. Um, left, would you say left is an academic word or a, a, a social vocabulary word? So left versus right. Every kindergarten tries to teach kids their left versus the right, only to come to the last day of school and realize when you're pledging allegiance to the flag, nobody really learned which one's left and which one's right. So it may carry over to first grade. If you take away three from five, how many are left? The past tense of Lee, you left your book on the bus. In politics, is he a member of the left or the right? Which side does she sit on, the left or the right? All of these are meanings of the word left, whether we think of it as an academic uh, language or social language or something else. He left her after she cheated on him, not in most first grade classrooms, we don't hear this kind of language, but I put it in here for you this afternoon. She left him $5,000 in her will. Okay, prepositions also, also change the meaning of uh, language in important ways. 
So the temperature fell to 10 degrees, the temperature fell by 10 degrees, or the temperature fell from 10 degrees. It's the prepositions that carry the meaning here. All right, so language learning is also cognitive. We know that there are the cognitive benefits of bilingualism. I have 10 minutes to tell you all of them, uh, but there are, we have a growing a plethora of research really right now that talk about the cognitive benefits of being bilingual. And many parents know this. That's why we have waiting lines for um, most of our dual language schools. Uh, we know that bilingual ed educated students have greater cognitive flexibility, that they have more cohesive family relationships, that they're likely to maintain their um, bilingual, the ones who maintain their bilingualism into high school are more likely to go to college, that it reduces dropout rates. We just have a lot of research. Okay, we also know the cogn that cognitively bilinguals are different than monolinguals, that there's an ontology of being bilingual. So the word VIX means something totally different in Spanish than it does in English, even though it's VIX in English and VIX, VIX Baburu. Okay, so take a look at this little meme with moms from Puerto Rico and how they're fighting coronavirus. With VIX, what else? You know, none of that other stuff. Um, take a look at this. The words are in Spanish, but the meaning, if you don't understand the meaning of the word VIX, you can understand that this is actually meant to be humorous. Okay, so language learning is psychological. Um, and I have their, um, I don't think that we can forget or we should forget the psychological trauma inflicted on families when we impose language restrictive policies. And so um, the psychologists tell us that a psychological pain is more traumatic than a physical one, for the body heals easier than the heart. Be careful of harming those that you love. And so as we enter into this new age, we can't forget that we have a lot of families, a lot of children and a lot of young adults that were psychologically very damaged by Proposition 227, by Question 2, by Proposition 203, and that continue to be damaged when children hear things like, it's time to build that wall or go back to Mexico. So we have to remember that these kinds of things can cause the very kids we want to become bilingual to reject their own language. It's not just a matter of telling them how beautiful it is. Um, so what are we up against? Um, this is one of the saddest things that I think I've seen. In 2018, um, here's a little graph about diversity in children's books. So you will notice that 27% of all the books published, children's books in 2018, were about animals. That is more than books published about American Indians, Latinx children, Asian Pacific Islanders, and African American kids put together. So we have a challenge with regard to how we're going to psychologically ensure that our kids know that it's a great thing to be bilingual and biliterate. Okay, so I'm going to suggest that we fill our classrooms with these kinds of books, not just books that are meant to teach kids to decode in Spanish and decode in English, but books that grab their attention and engage them in the struggle of becoming bilingual, because it's a struggle. I would also caution us to be careful about how we use things like this. So if a kid comes um, to school and sees a chart like this, as well-meaning as it is, because in fact we want to expand repertoires, um, casa, uh, in, the, in casa, this is the way we say something, and in escuela, this is the way we say something, inadvertently the message is what you're doing in, in your house may be incorrect and what you're doing in school is academic. I don't think that's what we wanna do. I think we wanna teach kids that there's a place for all of that language. So um, uh, I'm a big fan of a person named Fernando Peñalosa and he says, um, how, what do we gain when we get words from our parents and when we go to the university and told that these words are all wrong in the name of teaching me to be a proper bilingual teacher? So I think we have to be, be careful of the ways in which we're educating the next generation, not just of kids, but of teacher educators. Um, so a really nice book, Rethinking Bilingual Education, has a lot of testimonials. One of them is by a woman named Sandra Osorio. And um, she says she remembers that the books were based on, um, on English phonology. The books were translations, but she doesn't ever remember reading a story about a character who was actually struggling with becoming bilingual or enjoying being bilingual. Okay, le language learning is emotional and any of us who've tried to learn a second language know that. 
There are some days we think we got it, and other days we're just ready to give it all up and say, I'm just fine with being a, a monolingual. Um, what ends up happening is that many of our children have a, a love-hate relationship with the language. And so we have to make sure that the love trumps the hate somehow in the language learning and that it's emotional. Um, my colleagues and I have created what is my third slide here, which also takes all day to explain, but it's a holistic biliteracy framework where what we put out there is exactly what I just said in a few words, a way to look at the teaching of language and literacy writ large, where we are paying attention to things like oracy and reading and writing and understanding how language works and how languages are connected through the ways that we teach in our environments and just the way the languages are connected particularly in Spanish because they are um, both alphabetic, based on an alphabetic principle. I know that my time is getting uh, close. So I will say that all of this, culture's gotta be at the center. And this is one of my favorite readings from um, Sandra Cisneros, although I can't read it to you, um, and I'll tell you why, because the pictures of all my friends here are in front of the, <laughs> in front of the words. Uh, but basically what Sandra is putting out there is that um, there's, there's all this um, language about who's a Mexican and are you real Mexican? And so people are afraid of saying, we can't have, you know, we can't talk about Mexican American culture in my classroom because all, some of the kids are from Mexico, some of them have never been there. Um, so we can't, yes, we can. We just can't do it in a way that assumes that we can generalize all cultures and cultural groups. And that's the point of that. Now, I would like to thank you for um, being with us this afternoon and say, looking forward to getting started. And, and it's important to take baby steps, but baby steps we do need to take as long as we're moving forward. And what I'm hoping to say more than anything else is let's do move forward. Let's don't repeat some of the, the things that we did in the past that weren't as effective for children and families as we would have hoped for them to have been. So thank you very much. And now I'm very happy to answer questions. And I think Jan is going to um, moderate the questions and answers, right? I sure am. Thanks so much, Kathy. What a fabulous presentation and got a lot of good comments and thinking from, from us here backstage as well as our audience as well. Um, we had one question from Polly from Minnesota. And I think she was just really um, moved by your description of language and the idea of emerging bilingual, sequential, simultaneous. And she talked in this time now of distance learning, and I know you're really close to that sense of what's going on with that. Um, she teaches, it sounds like in a Spanish um, dual language immersion program. And she's really working to maintain the target language through her distance learning, sending videos in Spanish to her students and whatnot. And she's getting requests from parents that she also includes the English translation. And she wanted to know if you had any recommendations of how she could handle that situation with parents oh so she could keep the target language. Yeah, um, I, I do not. Um, I wish I had a URL to send you to. Um, I'm so sorry. I think that's an absolutely fantastic question. And I think that speaking of baby steps, we're really in the baby phase of online teaching and learning um, with it with many of our communities. I know that universities have some websites. I know the Center for Applied Linguistics has accumulated quite a few. Um, there's a resource here in Colorado called Colorin Colorado, and they have lots of online. Now, whether or not to the extent that the Spanish work is in English, I couldn't tell you that, but there are a lot of Spanish resources, so that could get her started. And boy, if the researchers of the future, um, what happened during this pandemic and how we dealt with it online in two languages are gonna be the stuff that needs to be written about for years to come. That's great. How would you respond to a parent who is really requesting, even though a, a teacher is um, wanting to maintain the target language, a parent is really requesting the information to them in English as well. Um, I think what, I think what they're telling us is that they want to be sure that the kids are continuing to practice English while they're at home and the parent may not feel like they're the best sources of support or modeling and they want, they want to be sure that kids aren't losing ground and I think that that's what every parent is worried about right now in this country in this particular time. 
That's great, thank you. We had another question from Alicia Ramirez, and she wanted to know in, in a short amount of time we have, how you would describe the difference between interlanguaging, translanguaging, and code switching. So, translanguaging has become an umbrella term for a whole lot of things, and code mixing and code switching is one of the parts that translanguaging encompasses. So it's one aspect of translanguaging. Um, I'm teaching a class right now, maybe I can answer this with a, um, an anecdote. So I'm teaching a class uh, of 28 teachers, all of whom are, are sequential bilinguals and Spanish was their first language. They speak English, they're bilingual, they're wonderful people, but they much prefer in their oral language to speak in Spanish. Everything we're reading in class is in English. And so frequently they will just read the work in English discuss the work in Spanish. That's also a type of translanguaging. That's great, that's really helpful. Um, Kathy, another question we have was, um, how do you feel about language separation in the classroom? Mm -hmm. If you're in a dual language immersion classroom and say it's Spanish and English or Arabic and English or another mm -hmm. language English, how do you feel about the, the concept of language separation? So I hope this isn't an unsatisfactory answer. So I feel like we erred to, in the early part of this century, we erred on the side of strict separation of language. And that did not respect anything that we know about translanguaging and the help that a target language can be to learning a second language. So we told the kid, either English or Spanish, but no room in between. You think in English, you think in Spanish. That's not the way human beings operate. Now. On the other side of that uh, pendulum, we don't want to swing to anything goes and use whatever you want to. In general, that's why we have a language policy in a school. However, we can clarify concepts in a language. If we see um, an example we use in Literacy Squared is a teacher talking about Cinderella going to the ball and then asking the kids, so what did Cinderella do? And the kids say, Oh, well, it was a, she must have gone to a basketball or a ball or a football or a football or a football. Pelote, ball es una pelota, pero también es un baile. Quick, quick re reversal to Spanish, quick clarification of a concept that could have taken us hours and hours to teach. So that is not adhering to a strict separation of language, but it is taking up a way that we can help kids figure out how they use one language to learn in another one. And that's the best thinking right now. But again, not anything goes. I want to un underscore that, not anything goes. That's why we have a language policy, but also not the, you know, we're gonna punish you if you use a word of Spanish when it's the English time. So that many of our programs are rethinking the strict separation of languages. That's great. Thank you, Kathy. Great. Thank you, Kath. It's it's a it's a it's a topic. One I think we could speak for hours on as well. Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah and people have very um, definite viewpoints about it. Definitely. You know, one of our, our participants asked, um, it kind of in that, that idea about how you had that great slide about showing the home language and, and school language. How would you, do you have examples of how Spanish literacy could be taught in the classroom, allowing home Spanish along with the, um, the school Spanish or the academic Spanish? Any suggestions on how that could be um, interwoven and taught together? Right, well, I think, again, all languages learned in context. So what is the context in which we would use um, puchar? And on the playground, who cares? Um, at a family gathering, who cares when we're writing a story about a family gathering and we were talking about playing on the swings? That we need, that, that's a register issue. Now, we're writing a, an email to someone who's highly judgmental and a purist, um, who, you know, an Iberian scholar, then we choose another word in Spanish that represents someone's viewpoint of a, of a, um, what do I want to say, uh, of a, um, a, pri a more privileged form or what's thought to be a higher status, which probably is not. What you don't want to do is have kids to think that what they're bringing from their home isn't valuable in school. And I don't think anybody does that on purpose. I think it inadvertently happens. I mean, I've seen worse examples than the one I showed you. I've seen examples of like academic and social and the social is all the 
what the kids bring and the academics all what's in school, which is a, uh, a, a different kind of a message. But there are reasons that we need a broad, we need a broad repertoire of skills. Definitely, it's a really good point. You know, we're getting a lot of questions now there and they're kind of practical questions for the classroom. Um, one question that we have from um, Beatrice Zamora is, should literacy be taught in both Spanish and English in a one-way dual language setting starting in kinder? What's your opinion on that? Yeah, so um, the reason that we created Literacy Squared, um, one of the big reasons was for children who were in um, bilingual programs or one-way dual language programs where somebody forced the teachers to try to identify a dominant language in kids and to only teach reading in that dominant language. Many of the kids come to school and they speak a fair amount of both languages. And so why are we waiting till third grade to teach kids to read in English when they come to school speaking English? Let's figure out a way to have a program where both literacy in Spanish and English are taught beginning kindergarten. Not duplicative, not the same instruction, but a different kind of reading instruction in Spanish than English. And that's the, not to give a shameless plug for the book, but it's explained in the book, you know, how we would suggest to people that kids maybe learn to do the decoding work in Spanish, but then they're reading something in English that's similar where we're working on something else. But we don't delay, we don't just teach reading in one language in kindergarten and then wait until third grade and introduce the second language. Okay, from Eugenia Moraflores. Eugenia is asking, how can we support English learners from diverse learning backgrounds with their heritage, when their heritage language is not a dominant heritage language in the district from instruction mm -hmm. to materials? Yeah, again, I'm gonna go back to the, here's my pat line for the day that I didn't think was gonna be my pat line, but what is the context in which they're going to need their heritage language? Are they gonna need it to argue a law case in a court? Or are they gonna need it to talk with their grandparents, to preserve the language, to write the stories of their heritage? So for, for what reasons, we don't have to, we can call ourselves bilingual without being able to do everything the same way in two languages. Um, and that, I think we have a, a friend, which I usually don't think of it as a friend, but that's the internet and that's computers. And that's, that's how we can preserve and develop and encourage children to maintain a language that maybe isn't the dominant language like, like Spanish is in some communities. It's, it is a challenge. I will tell you it's a challenge. Even people who um, are becoming bilingual in Spanish and English find it a challenge to maintain Spanish with their kids. Any, so suggestions, any, any suggestions how to do that? There are a couple of questions. How do we maintain that? How do we maintain that, that target where language? Books? Yeah, where are our books? Where are our sources of support? Where are our funds of knowledge in our community? Who can come into our classrooms? There were wonderful programs um, in the end of the 1990s that the government funded. They were called Project GLAD. And they were for lesser used languages at that time, like Hmong, Vietnamese, um, Korean, where a half an hour of every school day, and this isn't a, a full-blown bilingual program, but let me tell you that kids in Hmong learn to do that really intricate embroidery. They learn to do storytelling. They learn to do things that were culturally from their community and linguistically from their community that were designed to give kids a place in school to say, your language is valued and we can use it. There are, you know, there's not one way to do it, but there are multiple ways to do it, but it, it can be done and school is a place to do that. I think what's unfortunate is to say, well, you know, not very many kids speak Punjabi and so there's no place for it in school. I, I don't think that's the way to look at this at all. But I appreciate the question. I want teachers out there to know I appreciate the question because I appreciate the challenges. Is are we putting language and culture at the center of what we're doing? That's a really good point. You know, another question, Kathy, takes us to the idea of, of teacher preparation. Um, and I'm going to combine two questions. Um, one was just talking about um, the implications for teacher preparation and how we can prepare teachers. Because as Martha Sadavi mentioned, some teachers who are teaching Spanish aren't fully bilingual. And right. they're either in a dual language program or a single subject classroom in that target language. 
What do you feel that says about the future of bilingual education programs in, in Spanish, for instance, like for the future of our programs? And how do we support our teacher education programs to really yeah. develop high quality um, bilingually um, certified, biliteracy certified teachers? So again, I think we have to um, acknowledge that we have work to do and we have to be serious about it. So one thing, it, one thing is to say our university has a bilingual teacher training program. Another thing is to say, how many classes do you actually offer in Spanish? And what are the opportunities for people? Somebody comes to, to the university and they have spoken Spanish their entire life, but they've been US educated I can teach them accent rules. I, and I see their language as something to build on, not something to criticize for lack of opportunity to learn. I will tell you, and then don't tell my dean, um, I don't know who's on here, but I, I don't tell my dean that I, I don't think, not my dean, not, not many, I don't think that we're going to accomplish this until we get serious about it. And it seems like almost every iteration of a new teacher training program talks about culturally competent teaching, but few of us really talk about what is it going to take for us to be able to offer um, language courses that are taught in non-English languages and, and be serious about it and be serious about our own growth. And so I'll put myself in that mix. So that, that is something that I think we're gonna, we need coalitions around this. We need collaboration. We need partnerships. There are people in our community who could come do this. We could have team teaching people who could do this. We've got to have more people writing books in Spanish. Um, we're Another shameless promotion for our book is that we're in the process of translating some of the chapters, or um, I should say re rewriting some of the chapters into Spanish so that we can read them. Um, but it's not, a, um, I think we have to, to realize that what we have here is a whole lot of potential that we haven't developed. We, ex we expect people to come already with the tools in Spanish. We don't even have that expectation for native English speaking teachers when they come into teacher education. Why would we think that we shouldn't have to do anything with people who are going to teach in Spanish except tell them go out there and teach and then, you know, criticize them if they don't know certain things in Spanish. So we have a lot of work to do. And uh, you know, I'll remind you since 1997 to 2016, you really didn't, couldn't do teacher training. And the places, so places where we have a lot of natural pools of potential teachers didn't really have bilingual programs. So they weren't really doing bilingual training. That's the same with the University of Arizona, you know, the same in Massachusetts. I mean, so now I think we can do it if we get serious about it. But yes. it's an uphill, it's a pushing a rock uphill. Yeah. Definitely some real interesting challenges with that. But we can we can do it. We know we're really working towards you that in many different it. ways. Yeah. You way they, you know, Kathy, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Um, one I think is a really interesting question. Um, they're asking from your point of view in this 21st century global time that we live in right now, what do you think the teaching of new arrivals could look like? What are the top two or three things that you think are important in the teaching of newcomers or new arrivals? Yeah, um, in well, I think that's, well, I think that's changing by the day. Um, and the reason I say that is because we're in the middle of a pandemic. And I think poor kids who are new arrivals right now from China. This is not, I mean, because it's not just a simple matter of welcome to our school sit down, we're gonna teach you enough English till we can send you to the mainstream. It's how are we, what form, and I do believe that school has to be the place where this is going to happen, where once again, we are the place that says, welcome. Welcome, and we're not afraid of you because I am, I am really, really afraid of what sorts of latent racism is going to surface as um, people need to leave, still leave one country and come to the U.S. And I'm afraid it's going to take a whole nother shape. So I know that wasn't probably what someone was looking for in that answer. But first of all, I would make sure that kids feel like they're welcome in school. Um, they need a different kind of, of um, approach to English learning. I think we have to remember the old from 1984 saturation point theory that after about 20 or 30 minutes of English every day, you can't take in anymore. You reached your saturation point. Do something else. How do we um, maintain or encourage you to maintain your language? What are sources of culture conflict? 
and how do we make sure that people coming into our schools that that's uh, to me when i go to newcomer schools that we have here we have several in denver you know always they say boy we did not anticipate this level of um, culture conflict or we would have done that in the initial orientation so i i do believe however that newcomer education is going to take on a whole new I mean, they're going to have to solve a whole set of problems and I know teachers will do their darndest to do it. Absolutely. Well, Kathy, to bring us to a close and a, a reminder for our, um, our participants, if we didn't get to your question, we'll be doing a written transcript of them as well. One question, I think, just to leave us with your, your vision and sense of hope. I know you have, you've had your grandchildren in dual language immersion, yeah. you work with Thank many you many different families and, and students at the university and in different schools throughout the nation. You know, if you could think of what your ideal dual language program would look like, what are the top qualities or characteristics that you would just be able oh, to point out quickly right now, well, your, your top characteristics? Yeah, so I, I guess you probably want me to say something like, you know, that they're bilingual and biliterate spaces. And yes, I hope they are. But first and foremost, I hope they're happy places. I hope they're places that are good for children, where they can't wait to get out of the car every day to run into school, where you see families from all kinds of different language and cultural backgrounds who can get together for the benefit of their children, where there's, you know, healthy, where there's a rich curriculum that's beyond the all day of reading and math, where there are opportunities for field trips, where there, I mean, where schools, schools are more comprehensive than they are so narrowly focused on academic instruction and not for the purpose of teaching academics, because I'm not against academics, but for the purpose of passing a test. So, you know, places, places where children can thrive. I love that. Places where children can thrive and where better than in a truly authentic bilingual literacy program. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much, Kathy. I'm going to turn our program back now um, as we come to a close. And remember, our questions will be written in transcript. And um, I'm going to pass this over to Olivia, our Cabebor president again. Olivia? Thank you, Dr. Escamilla. What an inspiring, timely, and significant presentation. We could go on and on. There's just such eagerness to you know, learn and, and be able to apply all this in the classroom. This has been such a powerful addition to our CABE 2020 virtual community webinar series. Um, I would like to remind you that the recorded session and the handouts will be posted on the CABE 2020 virtual community website following today's presentation. I'm excited to share that we will be welcoming Dr. Jose Medina on Tuesday, April 21st at 3 p.m. And he is sponsored by Velasquez Press, a CABE 2020 Platinum sponsor as part of our CABE 2020 virtual community webinar series. Again, thank you to Kathy and Caslon, and thank you to all of our participants for joining the CABE 2020 virtual community. On behalf of the CABE Board of Directors and the full CABE team, we hope you have felt the CABE connection, inspiration, mm -hmm. and love just as if we were together physically at the CABE 2020 conference. Please stay safe be well and know that we were all in this together we are cabe strong thank you and hasta la próxima